Hello and welcome back. Um, so in this video, we will look at the so-called active contour models of snakes. Um, so one of the uh, you know uh, systematic uh, uh, kind of PDE based models to have come out of uh, uh, calculus of variations and one of the pioneering methods um, in the <coughs> in that class of methods, the pioneering work. Okay. So um, like I said before, it's a pioneering model using calculus variation calculus to determine curve evolution. So why is this so important? Um, because previous techniques or the techniques that came before this were all typically based on heuristics, uh, like a bunch of rules that you put together and uh, hope that it worked. But in this this one, the, uh, the this is of course used when I say this is this is used for segmentation. Um, they they uh, it, it it actually the rules actually came out of variational calculus. You know the by. Uh, by putting together a correct choice of uh, you know data terms, a loss function, and uh, regularization terms in the functional, uh, we arrived at a curve propagation equation uh, without having to explicitly specify rules. Okay, so here when I say data term and regularization term, I urge you to think back about the Brachistochrone problem where we looked at you know whether we go fast by dropping vertically down a bit so that time is reduced or we reduce time by going the shortest path. So that was the tension there. Here there is a tension between data and regularization terms. Okay, we'll, we'll look at this in more detail in the next few slides. Okay, so uh, why do they, why are they called snakes? So if you consider any object, okay, that is to be segmented, in this case an organ to be segmented uh, in a scene or an image, in the medical image, uh, the boundaries are basically the curves. The boundaries of objects or the curves and uh, that's the one that's so we seek to segment objects by propagating closed curves so that they can go and latch on to the boundaries of objects. Now, what is the other characteristic of boundaries of object? Typically in a medical imaging uh, uh, setting, the boundaries are characterized by high gradients. That is sharp changes in pixel intensity values or brightness values. Okay. So ideally the curve that we are propagating, that is the, that is we are trying to latch on to the boundary um, should also coincide. They should also coincide with regions of high gradients, right? So that is uh, one of the uh, <clears throat> important criteria to uh, that is considered in this method, right? So we have. So we are uh, right away. We are looking at the uh, various um, you know terms that go into the functional. So first, first we discuss that you know the gradient is an important term. So the gradient will tell you where sharp transitions in pixel intensity occurs. And we surmise that you know wherever there are sharp transition pixel intensities means that there is a change in the regions, right? That's the edge of the object that we are looking for. So we a priori don't know the object, but we our our uh, our hypothesis is that you know the edges of those objects correspond to regions of high intensity, and we want our curves to go and rest or latch on to regions of high intensity. So that's the one term. So that's the term that you see here negative gradient square okay so that means that you know you have um, um, you, you are looking for regions of why is it negative so where the gradient is high uh, it means that it's a very high positive value so you put in a um, negative sign there so that it becomes a very small number so you minimize so it becomes a very small number so you're trying to minimize our functional so one of the terms in the integrand is, is this that becomes a very small number when the gradient is very high the other terms that we want really small are this. So that's a. So here, this is where the tension is because we want them to latch onto the gradients, but we don't. We want them to be smooth, or they want to be a smooth curves. Okay. So this is your regularization term, which makes your curve smooth. Of course, there are various explanations for this, but I'll just give you a um, couple here. So what this term does, this delta c or delta s, I'll tell you what what these. Uh, uh, variables mean so the first this is the first derivative right the square there's a square there so make sure it's always you know we are dealing with positive numbers the square um, so the delta c or delta s make sure that you don't have very sharp discontinuities in your curve okay and what this also uh, ensures is that you have a very tight curve or it you are or basically you, your curve is as small as possible okay so it doesn't have sharp discontinuities and it's generally very tight to be a very uh, uh, curve, um, when you say uh, short as possible, the length of the curve is shortened. Okay, this is the length shortening term. Uh, so that's that's the first derivative. This second term, this is just to make sure that the curve is not too wriggly, right? 
so you don't want some so there if you have an object let's say that's the object that you are trying to segment okay and your curve right you don't want some curve going like this this is what we saw you don't want a lengthy curve right so this is a very long curve right and this term makes sure that the sharp discontinuities don't occur rather you have a smooth curve right a fairly shortened curve the second term what it does is make sure that you no know, you can also have curves like this so you have abrupt changes in the first derivative so you, this is what um, this happens just make sure that your curve is not super wiggly it's more smooth okay so what are these c is the curve obviously uh, it's just a notation what is c of s represent okay this is just some parameterization so s is a parameter that goes from 0 to 1 okay i'm sorry i'm just writing it in a very poor way let me just write this off um, so s s could belongs to 0 1 so it varies yes very smoothly from 0 to 1 so it's a parameter which generates the curve okay so 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 yes is a par so it's so your curve your, par your parameter is pe curve by s okay c of s basically it just means you can think of it as generating x of s c of s is nothing but a pair of points x of s and y of s okay so x and y are basically points on the curve so you are think of a curve it's in a plane x and y on points on the curve and you can generate the curve by varying s smoothly there are many parameterizations available we won't go into that so for instance you can um, think of s as maybe you know um, you know cosine theta and sin you know and uh, uh, for instance um, x can be let's say r cosine theta and y can be r sin theta okay this is one parameterization you can put r to be 1 so you get only cosine theta sin theta and you can actually vary theta right so you can of course normalize it so that theta varies from 0 to 1 and then you multiply accordingly right so those things can be done right so that's s is just one parameterization like that so there are lots of parameterizations available you don't have to worry about that now we will cross that bridge when we get there so c of s is nothing but it's a it's a vector of these points x and y right it's a collection of x and y which make up the curve so that's what we always when you say c we are only looking at you know this bunch of points x comma y one second i'll just wipe this out and oh, yes that's good so you have these points x comma y so uh, you can generate them right so you can have x1 y1 up to xn yn if you discretize it if you choose to discretize otherwise it's a continuous parameterization so yes smoothly varies from 0 to 1 so that you can generate all the x and y possible right so infinite number of x and y possible which make up the curve okay so there are these two terms one is like i said the negative of the gradient squared the gradient of f here here f, f refers to the image okay here we can use i but typically it's bad choice in this uh, kind of work f is a, refers to the image c of s here it basically we are evaluating the gradient only at the curve so at all the points that make up the curve we are evaluating that's why that's that's it's f of c of s okay so the gradient so for the curve to be optimal so if you want to the curve to latch on to the object boundary we we stipulate that at the points wherever the curve is you want a very high gradient okay which means that if you take a negative of the gradient which means a very large a very uh, large negative value which means a very small number there so the minimum that's why we are trying to minimize that okay so large gradients and we want the curve to be smooth okay so which means the, that's why we are adding the first and second derivative terms these are called regularization terms okay so uh, these are the two competing forces forces that we have talked about right um, like the shortest path you know highest velocity high speed path we are looking at you know it has to latch on to strong gradients at the same time it should not be a too big too big a curve or too long a curve and it's also not be too wiggly a curve okay so that is the uh, uh, tension here and of course we are trying to minimize this following function functional we add this e internal is this energy which corresponds to the regularization term and this i call the data term because f is the image that's the data that's given to you and you are trying to estimate uh, the gradient from the data so that's the data term so and here and they in the paper they have referred to as an external term okay e internal energy and the external energy i like to call it regularization and and the data term so there is just the you know um, a play interplay between 
the stew terms typically you will have these parameters alpha and beta here okay now alpha and beta can depend on s also um, or they can be independent of s either way is fine and they are the terms that 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 you know that gives you the ability to control how much importance you give to each of those terms okay so by making the alpha and beta small or zero uh, you can um, make their influence small or larger okay so that's the that's the idea so that's the entire loss function so that you put them into the loss functional you are trying to minimize the loss functional with respect to what you are trying to estimate c of s like we had for the curve in the bracket stock run problem here we are trying to estimate the segmenting curve c of s which will form the boundary of the object so once you have the boundary of the object we can find the interior also so we are trying to estimate c of s or alternatively since c of s is nothing but collection of these points x comma y which make up the curve we are estimate trying to estimate a bunch of x comma y right which form the boundary of the object by minimizing this functional okay so and of course remember s is the parameterization of the curve yes there is continuously from 0 to 1 and as s varies continuously from 0 to 1 you can generate x and y as you will okay all right so likewise just to uh, uh, you know get a better understanding of this next functional consisting of three terms like i said the first term the data term the curve should coincide with high gradient regions which typically form the boundary of the object so in medical imaging also in lot of situations the uh, boundary does form uh, you know the, the boundary does have high gradients it's sometimes in the paper they refer to as the external energy term okay the second term um, is the regularization term penalizes the first derivative so it means this typically leads to a smooth short length curves there is no without kinks right suddenly there will be going to be kinks so it's a smooth short length curves so this is a curve shortening term right okay so it will it will just collapse the curve into a point if there is nothing stopping it the third term also the regularization term is again penalizes the second derivative of the curve With respect to arc length, I say with respect to arc length, but you know, yes, it's basically some parameterization. This prevents excessively wiggly curves. Okay, that's what we want, right? Go back. I'm um, sorry to do that. So there are two terms, right? So the first derivative term, second derivative term. So you have you have some function, right? You, you if you will see that there is an energy term. I call it the energy term. There'll be this uh, f gradient of f. It depends on c of s. So it's a function of that, right? you also have the um um you know it's the your uh, your uh, uh, your function the integrand inside the functional is 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 has the c prime term and the c double prime term okay here the c is implicit in f okay so these three terms are there and so then you have the form of the equation you know to use to uh, euler lagrange equation to use in order to derive so i had used f of cs okay ideally you know think of just uh, don't use f maybe you just use this e okay this f is basically because i have used this f inside the uh, functional when you are trying to derive the euler lagrange equations right so then you know that can be a bit confusing so feel free to instead of f use some other uh, symbol um, so that you know you don't get confused so i am not but So now, um, sorry about this uh, spelling mistake. It's couple of methods, not couple uh, four methods. So we're going to be only looking at the second one, right? Um, this here, uh, numerically solving the Euler-Lagrange equation. So we'll derive the Euler-Lagrange equations. Uh, of course, you it, it. I won't go through every step because some of the steps are just you know calculating derivatives. Okay, so I urge you to do that. Once you know what the Euler-Lagrange equation, uh, you know what the Euler-Lagrange equations are. You know what f is. and you know there are two uh, there are yeah, there is there's again like you saw here uh, that we the the, the uh, curve prop curve propagation equations for this bear with me you should you problem okay so if you actually apply so remember um, just to be uh, clear you know i'm i think i'm using uh, this uh, f too much okay so i i'm going to just switch um, notation a bit because if you look at the um, i'm sorry i have to go back and forth but you are when you're trying to do the derivation so when you actually formulate the euler lagrange equation this is what you will get okay what do you get okay so now how are you going to solve this problem okay so the again gradient of e external c of s equal to, i'm just using this term as it is gradient with respect to with respect to x and y actually right 
that's what you will have so um, and these terms will only with respect to s and uh, delta s and the second derivative with respect to delta s in fact second and fourth derivative right 1 over delta s and 1 over delta s square ideally this alpha should be inside because if it's a function of s you can take that out but i'm assuming it's constant in this case okay so what is it now we have to understand this so the way to solve this you know you have to suppose you have to solve it there are no analytical solution so you have to solve it using numerical approximations okay so i urge you to go and actually derive this okay it's not you just have to plug in the correct uh, function expressions in the euler lagrange equation that you saw in the previous video okay and then you can uh, get to this very quickly it's not too hard to do okay um so uh, how do we how do we discretize this okay so the discretization scheme is what i have shown you so if this is the curve the blue points are the discretization so s of i minus so there you take let's say capital n points we discretize this capital n points and you can then you you in fact you, you have to choose it so that they are equal distance apart typically that's how it's sample that this length and this length are the same even though in my picture they are not drawn to scale ideally you choose those points n points on the curve for a discretization so that they are um, you know they are equally spaced and of course the first and last points coincide okay that's your boundary condition the first and the last points coincide okay and and the way you calculate the derivatives with respect to s any parameterization is parameterization is that you actually um they use the use the uh, use your discretization itself so for instance the first derivative with respect to uh, if i can zoom in a bit allow me to zoom in a bit it might get tilted but allow me to zoom in a bit um so the first derivative is calculated by you know its finite difference approximation so d delta c or delta s at si is nothing but c of si which means the c of si is nothing but the xi comma yi at that point minus c of si minus 1 divided by h where h is the distance between these two points at the uh, these two point that you have discrete discretized okay so that's the that's the first first derivative similarly you can uh, you know uh, write down for the second derivative also this again uh, you know if you if you are using numerical if you do some some numerical analysis these are standard formulas similarly for the second derivative of the curve at si you have this formula right again um, um, i have made a mistake here it's not r it's c okay i think once again Uh, i was referring to multiple textbooks and i i was trying to use c because it seems to be more commonly used than r somehow it slipped in there sorry about that so h is again the distance between successive points okay now these are for the first and second derivative what you do is you take this and you plug it back in these equations so now you are going to calculate delta over delta s of delta c over delta s now you have delta c over delta s that formula here right that formula is right there already seem to have um sorry there is something i have done which i need to take care of okay now it's done okay so now you have delta c or delta s the expression for this now you have to do uh, delta or okay um i have put one over delta s but i was I, I should have put delta over delta s. I'm sorry. This seems to be again a mistake here. We'll correct that. So delta over delta s of here. This is delta. Also, this delta s of delta c over delta s. Now, now what you have to do is in order to do this, you, you instead of c of s i, you just put delta c over delta s. C of s i minus one, you put delta c over delta s. That's it. Or you can directly use this formula. But better still, directly use this. Formula. delta or delta s so because alpha is not a, a function of s you are assuming it to be constant if you assume it to be constant you will directly plug this in this equation for the second derivative again of the second derivative for every uh, instead of c of s i plus 1 you have to substitute delta delta square c of delta s square at i plus 1 and delta square c of delta s square at s of i and delta square c um by delta s square at i minus 1 so again i seem to change this you plug this in there write down these expressions and you can simplify okay once again if i am not i have chosen to um simplify it we can look at it later time um in practice you know you can also discretize the functional itself so it's possible to do that straight away you know the original expression we had the the functional expression we can discretize that and then take the derivatives then 
uh, based on the discretized functional. So if you do that, you know, we'll be end up with the following set of equations. Okay, you can actually derive them. It's very uh, not too hard to do. Again, I urge you to do that. And if we find time, I will go through this in slightly more detail than um, than what I'm doing now. So you'll end up with this set of two equations. Okay. Again, the E is basically the image term, right? It's the gradient of the image evaluated at the curve. A is a pentadiagonal banded matrix, which basically carries the weights of the, um, you know, uh, the finite difference terms. Okay. And this, these are the two, you know, simplified or the final form for the Euler-Lagrange equations. Now that we have this, what do we do, right? So it's not done yet. So this just gives you some way of, um, you know, uh, some relationship between, or like I said, the tension between how you how you move the points, you know, because A is the regularization matrix. You can think of it that way. A is the matrix that regularizes your curve. Uh, delta E, delta X is, gives you the gradient information. So just like this tension between the two. So how do you propagate the curve, right? That's what we are going to look at. So, but it's not done there. What we have to do is something called gradient descent, right? So because what, but what we have learned, right? Remember um, that at the optimal position, right? of the curve, once the curve has latched onto the boundary of the object, then the curve no longer moves, right? So which means that this delta IC or delta T equal to zero. But this delta C or delta T equal to zero is again, um, it just that's how, you know, we have defined the equilibrium position. So which means that, you know, we are tracking the time curve over time, okay, we're tracking the curve over time. So we can also, so if you think about it, if you want to evolve the curve over time, then we can actually do this so-called gradient descent. Okay. So if till we find the optimal position, we have to evolve the curve. And how do we evolve the curve? We evolve the curve in the direction of increasing gradient, which is what this the minus delta j tells you. Okay. That's how you uh, propagate the curve. So delta c or delta i is minus delta j is just the gradient descent equation. So you you are propagating the curve in the direction of uh, you know, um, the opposite of the direction of increasing gradient, which is basically the gradient of the function. That's what we have because we are trying to estimate the curve itself. So we have delta c over delta t is minus delta j, and minus delta j is what we estimated here. This is minus delta j. These terms. So then we can write this delta c over delta t as time stepping. So this again, you do a finite difference approximation. Like I said, c of s is nothing but pairs of vertices x comma y. So then we can get this time stepping equation right here, which we can simplify to get the equation in this final form. Okay. So A is a matrix that can be, um, you know, th there is again a small confusion here as to why I put x of t plus 1 here, but I put t there. Okay. So this is called a semi implicit uh, formulation. Okay. Because you know, but the way to look at it is you propagate the curve, you move the curve based on the gradient equation at the current time step. And then you move it and once you move it at the, once after you move it, then you regularize it. Okay, that's what we are doing. So it's semi-implicit. It turns out, you know, it has much more desirable, you know, numerical convergence properties. So this is again, uh, you know, techniques borrowed out of numerical analysis. So this is actually a very complicated method to actually, uh, you know, understand and code. So you start with calculus of variations, you form the correct functional where there is a, a tension between how smooth your curve has to be or regularized your curve has to be uh, and uh, you know how badly you want it to latch on to the um, gradients in the image, the curve to latch on to the gradients in the image. And then from there the Euler-Lagrange equations come out but they are non-trivial to solve. So you solve them by using the semi-implicit numerical analysis technique. Okay. By and of course you have to discretize these things properly. Okay. So, what are the advantages of this thing? So it, the curve evolution equations emerge automatically for you. you didn't do anything other than intuitively decide this, right? You intuitively decided I want a smooth curve and I want it to be attracted to gradients. Okay. That's the, that's the condition you imposed and the rules for moving the curve around the mathematics for moving the curve around came out automatically. Of course, it's very complicated, but it still does came out, right? And um, so, and think about this, actually, this actually provides a framework where you can incorporate multiple forces or other energies, okay. And of course, you use convex terms, which basically uh, something that has only, you know, a global minima, but again, we won't get into that. So you add terms, which, which are amenable to, you know, easy to differentiate and have, you know, don't have too many local minima, okay. 
so you can like add more forces to make it move faster etc we'll see a couple of them not in detail let's mention them they call balloon forces and there's something called the gradient vector field okay what is the disadvantage it converts to local minima why would it converts to local we would take any any image to think about it yeah a lot of images will have noise and noises are typically high gradients okay so which means that you know a curve can latch on to a uh, um a, a noisy pixel or a group of noisy pixel which might not correspond to the object of interest in the image okay and pro improper initialization can cause slow convergence so typically this method is kind of sensitive to initialization you pretty much have to start very near to the boundary that you want to segment you might say that's no fun how do you, why would you want to do that it's better than drawing by hand if you have a large number of images to annotate it's best that you start very you know you initialize this and it automatically converges to the boundary okay now it's difficult to code because you have to keep track of all the points okay that that's a double edged sword because you know you don't have to keep track of see, for an entire image you know, you're trying to segment an entire image you have to keep track of only like you know a finite set of points you don't have to keep track of every pixel keep track of every pixel okay however keeping track of every each of these points because you are you are propagating them is hard because you don't want them to converge to one point you don't want them intersecting all these are much more difficult programmatically to enforce okay so there are variants of this i will not go into the details if i have fine time i will there is something called a balloon force remember the first derivative term makes the curve shrink okay but sometimes you know you want them to blow you know to expand a bit based on you know um, you know certain image statistics so that is possible that has been done so it's called a balloon force which moves the curve move in any direction it expand and compress okay the gradient vector field also remember see sometimes you know image is pretty smooth contains maybe one or two objects but away from the objects there is no uh, strong gradient so if you initialize slightly further away from the boundaries of the object your curve will never converge okay so it will get it will just keep moving very slowly of course if you uh, continue to uh, do time stepping for thousands of time steps then maybe it will converge but that's very slow and not practical so something called a gradient vector field wherein you think of it as smoothing the gradients from the edges away from it right you have a very strong edge but then you can maybe smooth it a bit so that it is it, it the, the the gradient values are kind of dispersed around the object a little bit further than the boundary on on either side so that lets the constraints convert smoothly again this is accomplished this is non trivial to accomplish it you have to solve one more um, you know functional you know the, the, it, you have to derive one more functional and you actually formulate the euler lagrange there and then you and then you get a gradient vector field which you use for propagating okay so this is kind of a, you know two step uh, kind of think of it like a two step problem but again this is very po very popular and and people have um, you know used it very effectively right because for a long time these methods were there uh, only ones which which can be used without too many heuristics because you know for every image you can't make up heuristics every modality you can make up you can't make up heuristics this comes from very simple sound principles okay so thus this concludes our uh, overview of snakes like i said some of the derivations i have skipped i have showed you the general principle um so you can uh, you know by plugging into the uh, you know um, all the lagrange equations actually taking the derivatives is not too hard if you have done plus 2 uh, mathematics you should be able to do um only thing the only tricks there would be there's a discretization etc you have to actually work out it again that's also not too hard some of these uh, discretization like the only two formulas you need to know are the ones i showed you and that you should be able to do okay um all right so we will end this class here and we'll look at you know a further development on this because like i said the disadvantage is keeping track of the snakes right it's hard a problem so how do we get get over that that's where we run into level sets okay so we'll talk about that in the next lecture